It seemed like the the customers, the guests were just dying to get back into the restaurants. Like, you know, I had people calling me all the time, like, can I get a table? And so that was really exciting. And, and I think we've just rolled with the punches of, you know, the the scares that we've had over the last year. But it feels really good to just do the work that we love and to be able to come to a space that we feel is safe um, and that the people are enjoying it. So it's been, man, full circle, all the emotions this year. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Some chefs push the limits of gastronomy with breathtaking technique and surreal presentations. Others tap into their ancestry and explore the combinations and flavors of their heritage. And some seek a greater connection to the produce and land and the best ways to let ingredients show their true nature. There are many reasons people turn to cooking as a career, but those with an innate natural ability to connect with produce and let it shine often deliver something special for the culinary landscape. Danielle Alvarez is the head chef of Fred's in Paddington, Sydney. Danielle, how are you going? Hey, I'm good. How are you, Huck? I'm good. We're really stoked to have you on because you've been quite an influence on Australia's dining scene since you've been here. But you came to Australia um, from from the US uh, yeah. to open Fred's and you seem to have a real amazing uh, connection with Australian produce. What's it been like building that connection over the last couple of years? Well, it's been a really fun journey. Um, I came from the US, I think it's been seven years now. And I, w- I knew that it was possible to open a sort of, you know, farm to table, paddock to plate, whatever you want to call it, style of restaurant. But I wanted to You know, rather than just doing that gratuitously to say that's what we do, it's really important to form a lot of relationships with the people that you do that with. So I think it was really exciting for me when I first came here to see that that was something that still had room to be developed. You know, coming from California, there's so many small organic farms and the produce is so readily available that almost anyone could cook that way if that's what they wanted to do. But you know, it seemed like it was going to be a bit more work here, which I was willing to do. And, and there's been ups and downs. And there's been times where I felt completely positive about that connection and the farms that we work with. And then last year was, you know, a tremendous blow to so many of them. And, and a lot of our key farming partners left. And so we've sort of been rebuilding now. And I think, again, I'm, I'm renewed. I'm optimistic. I'm feeling good about it. But it's certainly, been, it's certainly been tough. It was certainly a restaurant that was talked about for years before it eventually opened. Yeah. But, and you, you were here for a couple of years before it opened. And can you tell us about that period of time and, and what it was like? Had you been to Australia before to explore the produce? Um, I had been here um, before I decided to make the move and take the job that was offered to me, Um, but I hadn't spent a whole lot of time. Um, So it was really a bit of a leap of faith in um, making that move. But those two years were, you know, a a very (laughs) challenging time for me personally, you know, not just um, waiting for the restaurant to be open, but Um, my brother was diagnosed with cancer and, and it all got really serious, really fast. So I think it it feels like a bit of a blur those two years before we opened, but I do know that in that two years, that's really when I started to make sure that I was spending time going out to see farmers, not just calling them on the phone, but spending time on their properties, walking around with them and making those connections and also doing the same with a lot of key suppliers. So it was really like foundation building time. Um, but I think timing wise, it was it was good that the restaurant wasn't opened because of the family problems. If I If I had not had that time, like if the restaurant had opened in that period, I honestly probably would have just gone home. So, um, it was, um, timing. It's everything. You have an extraordinary uh, career prior to coming to Australia and we can touch on that, uh, shortly, but how did it all come about and getting the job to open Fred's and come to Australia? Um, it was really like kind of a 
serendipitous thing. I, I was living in California at the time and I had spent about eight years already there and was ready for a move, but I didn't know where, what, you know, what country, if, if leaving the country was even an option to me, but I came to Australia, um, and I, I instantly loved it. I really connected with the, you know, the beach culture. I saw that the restaurants, there was like a really great, uh, scene of young chefs that wanted to do cool things. Um, and I felt really inspired by that. And like I said, I still saw that there was massive opportunity. Uh, but it's not as though I was like, okay, this is where I want to go. I'm going to go out and find someone to hire me. Then I kind of just like told a few friends how much I loved it. And the opportunity came to me. Um, it was an Australian guy that I worked with um, named David Pryor, who um said, oh, well, you know, Maryvelle actually reached out to me to see if there were any chefs that uh, might want to move up to Australia to open a restaurant, kind of like Chez Panisse, which is where I was working. So I thought, wow, I mean, that's like when when you're thinking you want something and it comes knocking, you really can't turn it down. So um, I took the opportunity and um, went from there. Uh, you briefly mentioned Chez Panisse there, which has had an incredible impact on the uh, dining landscape uh, over in America. Tell us about your your time in that restaurant and, and how it helped shape who you are as a cook. I mean, I think that restaurant has shaped everything up until that point for me. You know, chefs, you continue to evolve and change, but it really laid the groundwork and the foundation for how I wanted to cook. Um, you know, it was, I can't even believe I got that job in the first place, but you know, it, it's pretty magical. We arrive, chefs would arrive in the afternoon around one o'clock. We'd all sit down under a beautiful wisteria tree outside and, and talk about what was on the menu that day. And it changed every single day. Um, and there were no, like, there were no recipes or anything. It was really cook from your soul kind of food and when you're a young chef and you really don't have any confidence and you don't really know how to make a lot of things you really have to use your intuition and your palate and you have to be pretty brave now looking back on that um to walk into that space with these really experienced chefs and try to try to keep up with them basically um and i did that for four years and i think for the first two years it was pretty scary every single day and then after that I started to recognize things a little bit more like okay I have seen this before I have this reference point for that dish I've used this ingredient before now so I know what to do with it this time you know that kind of stuff and that's when I really started to learn more about flavor and taste um and and the other cool thing about it that I think is worth mentioning is you know we would taste our dishes that we would cook every day, twice a night at the beginning of the service to check for anything that needed to be changed with the head chef. And then in the middle of the two seatings, we would all sit down as a kitchen and eat the dinner ourselves. Yeah. And then come back in and do the second seating. So um, it was pretty, again, just magic. Did you find dishes change with that second tasting? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, as I, I, well, I'm sure people that are chefs listening to this would understand that things add the more you work with them if it's a new dish on it takes a little while to kind of get your rhythm and perfect and 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 really nail it out and sometimes it takes several days which we didn't have the luxury of that so um we were we were always constantly examining it seasoning acidity texture all that kind of stuff to see what we could improve and and there were small improvements all along the night is there any ingredients or combinations that you look back uh, fondly about from that period of time in your cooking career? Well, I mean, I think um, it's pretty hilarious seeing because my my cookbook that was released is called Always Add Lemon. I really think citrus was one of those things that just blew me away the more and more I used it in California. It's kind of um, Meyer lemons are really an iconic flavor to me that as soon as I smell them or taste them, I just, I'm transported back to the kitchen at Chez Panisse. And I'll never forget, like, you know, it, it sounds so simple now, but 
you know, how David Tannis, the chef that hired me, he would make this little relish that we'd put on mostly like raw fish, but also cooked fish dishes and poultry that was diced up pieces of whole Meyer lemon. And I just remember thinking, I never would have thought to use citrus that way, like just dicing it up and mixing it into something. And, you know, the regular lemons that you get, um, Eureka lemons would be a little bit too bitter and acidic for that. But Meyer lemons are that perfect balance of sweetness, aroma, fragrance, and you just want to eat the whole thing. So that's one one big one for me. You started your career at the French Laundry, which is in the same region, but vastly different experience to that of Chez Panisse. Take take us back to those days and, and how different that was compared to the time at Chez Panisse. Well, yeah, I mean, completely different, but also similar in the ingredients that were used. So, uh, you know, French Laundry at that time, I mean, and, and arguably still now, but at that time, I think was really at its pinnacle. And when I was leaving culinary school, I just thought, why not? Why not try to go straight to the top? So I, I wrote to them and, and they took me on as a, as a three month intern. And I had saved enough money to, to make sure that I could um, afford to live there while I was doing that. And it was T- totally terrifying if i'm really <laughs> honest it's a very very intense kitchen um and i i don't think i learned as much well i, I certainly didn't learn a whole lot about cooking but i learned a whole lot about professionalism commitment you know, teamwork, all that kind of stuff that i think is really good foundational stuff so as much as i didn't take away um really anything from the cooking side of things. Um, I still learned a lot about what it means to be in a kitchen and what it meant to be a chef, which still, I think, plays into who I am now. You briefly mentioned uh, going to culinary school and your cooking is a very natural type of cooking, particularly the influence of Chez Panisse that doesn't um, present images of what happens in culinary schools. Tell us about that time and how different uh, you were as a chef after that, did you have to let go of some of the um, things you had learned through culinary school? Well, actually, it's funny. I think, actually, you know, the things that I learned in culinary school were, were really good, like foundational tools. And funnily enough, a lot of like what happens happened at Chez Panisse was was quite similar, like making a classic um, sauce from reducing stocks of bones and, and meat trim, making really nice, um, simple terrines or pâtés, um, all the classic sauces, basic cakes, etc. Like a lot of that still, I remember using those skills and those techniques at Chez Panisse because Chez Panisse at its core is really super classic. And although it may seem kind of loosey, you know, airy fairy, it is still very much rooted in very classic French and Italian techniques. So a lot of that stuff learned at school still really served me in that time a lot. Take us back to your childhood. Where did, where did this all begin for you? Where did the interest in food start? Um, probably with my mom, for sure. My mom and my grandmother. And I think that's like, for a lot of people, it's that. But I was a pretty lucky kid in that um, they were both incredible cooks. And they're both Cuban. Um, my grandmother, uh, born and raised in Cuba. My mom, born in Cuba, and then moved to the U.S. Um, as an immigrant in the late 1950s. Um I was born in Miami and I, I, from as young as I can remember, I remember standing next to my mom in the kitchen while she was cooking something. I was always chopping all the vegetables to go into her sofrito or what, or, you know, her pot of beans or roast pork or whatever it was. Um, and I was just mesmerized by it. She had this ability to make everything taste delicious. And through that, you know, I think ex- expressed a lot of her love and care for her family. Um, And that really, I got swept up in that. I love the idea of um, showing people you love them through food. What's some of your favorite dishes from your your childhood that that have lived on for you? I think the classic Cuban dishes, um, which I don't, 
I don't really dare cook for myself here <laughs> um, because a lot of the ingredients I can't really find. But one of my favorites is a dish called ropa vieja, which translated from Spanish to English means old clothes. So not doesn't <laughs> sound overly appealing, but it's um, you take like a beef uh, flank steak and you boil it. She would always use a um, pressure cooker to make that process go faster with onions and celery and um and then once it was kind of falling apart, she'd take it out and you shred it. And that's where the old clothes thing comes from. Um, and then the the classic basis of almost every Cuban dish that I can remember starts with sofrito. So in Cuban cooking, that's garlic, that's onions, that's red capsicum, some tomato and some dry white wine. Um and then a few spices, you know, cumin, oregano, sometimes some orange juice or lime juice. And that gets really concentrated and beautiful. And you add in um, the shredded beef, um, always served with white, white rice, and then usually some sweet plantains, um, which are just, you know, really, really mature ripe plantains that get fried in a bit of oil served on mm. the side. Yeah, does, so good. <laughs> does that sort of uh, cooking creep into what you do these days at Fred's? Well, I see a lot of connection between like that kind of cooking and a lot of the um, classic Italian dishes that I, I probably cook more professionally now. Um, yeah, I think the connection to Italian food is is easy for me to see, like sweating off a mirepoix um, of onions, garlic, carrots, etc., and then building like a bolognese on top of that just feels like like the same exact process, just some dim different ingredients. And I don't know why I don't really, you know, include too many Cuban dishes in what I do, but maybe I will one day. Maybe that's how I'm evolving. I'm not sure. Let's have a look at Fred's. It's um made a huge impact on Sydney's dining landscape. It's a really busy restaurant and rightly so. Tell us about building that restaurant and it's got a beautiful design with that really big open sort of kitchen as if you're in someone's um, house. Uh, t tell us a bit about Fred's. Yeah, so, um, you know, I when I first met with Justin Hems, who's um, owner of um, Maryvale Group, he uh, he really let me just tell him what I wanted to do, which was, you know, I couldn't believe it, but um, he's so brilliant in that way that he, it, when he sees someone that has a talent that is passionate about what they do, he really does let them put their ideas forward. So um, he said, you know, why don't you design the kitchen and let me know, um, show me what, what you've come up with. Um, and so I did a sketch that was like a 3D sketch. And, and I had studied architecture in school, but I didn't follow through with it. But I knew how to do a few of those little drawings just to get his head around what I was thinking because I, I did feel like it was pretty absurd, really, <laughs> <laughs> to, to have a kitchen like this. But I, I knew it would be beautiful and I knew people would really connect with it, um, or at least I hope they would. And um, I showed him the sketch and he was like, yep, okay, cool, let's do it. And if you look at the sketch now, I still have it tucked away somewhere. It, he he did it exactly as I had drawn it, like even where the taps that I had drawn were, the, you know, the pot fillers in the back of the stove, like all of it identical. So they really trusted me in that. And um, yeah, I still can't believe that. But then they built this incredible restaurant around this kitchen, which is the kitchen is the center of the room. The, you know, there is no division between dining room and kitchen and, that that kind of transparency is what we wanted and we did want it to feel like a great dinner party. There's many kitchens that are open to restaurants, but few quite like Fred's. Has there been challenges or difficulties being so open to the public like that? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> I definitely, if I ever had to do it again, I would never do that again. <laughs> Mostly the fact that I can't like cry in front of everyone <laughs> when I really want to. When things aren't going well. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of challenges, but I think we've, we've made it work. I think the thing you learn over time is that you really have to think about when you're thinking about longevity and sustainability, you have to think about efficiency. So there's lots of little things that 
make it harder. You know, if it's a big space, but not a whole lot of places to put things, if you know what I mean. So there's a lot of, um, you know, taking extra steps when you shouldn't have to. And um, I think it's just more that, that it's just a little more tiring. But I think the the openness, I I would have thought that would have made it more exhausting, like the constant being on and all of that. But actually, that's probably the thing that gives me the most energy is that I get to be a part of dinner every night. And I get to see someone taking the first bite of a new dish and really being into it. And also, likewise, I get to see someone taking a bite of something and not really enjoying it. But being able to see that and correct it and address issues straight away is really, I think, um, I think a benefit of being right there in the middle. You told us that beautiful story about each night at Chez Panisse when the menu was created and then all the chefs sitting down and trying those dishes midway through service. What's the process at Fred's of putting the menu together? Well, we we change some things, you know, every day. We don't change the entire menu top to bottom. Um, but it's usually just starts with an idea from myself or, or one of my sous chefs of something they really want to try. Or, you know, we do our farm orders and usually that will dictate okay, we've got X, Y, and Z coming in this week. We've got to use this in a dish. We've got to use that in a dish. And it really seems to like just flow pretty naturally, I would say. It's not like, okay, on Wednesdays we do this and on Thursdays we do that. Like it really just, I think it has to be that way because of the nature of using things from farms. And sometimes you think you're getting something, but you know, the harvest was bad and, and it's not going to arrive or, you know, it rained and, and they weren't able to pick or whatever. So you really just mm. have to be adaptable. Um, and I think, you know, we'll always make something and taste it and be sure that we're happy to go with it. Um, and then it goes on the menu. You mentioned how you made lots of connections with farmers uh, and growers when you first got here and the events of the last year has impacted heavily on some of those and you've been rebuilding and reconnecting. Who, who are some of your favourite producers and can you tell us about some of the stuff that you're using? Um, yeah, I sure can. Um, well, we're using um, Epicurean Harvest quite a bit lately, which I'm so happy that that relationship has really grown because I think at the beginning of my time they you know that's a young couple named Erica and Hayden and now they have a little young baby um but at the time I think they were only supplying Peter Gilmore at Key and they didn't really have much else to be able to share around and then I think they were able to grow slightly enough to where they could manage but that they'd have more availability for other restaurants so we started buying from them as soon as we could and you know they're someone that i really really believe in because they're young and ambitious and they really want to take care of the environment while they farm um and i think as we all know the average age of farmers is much much older so supporting a younger generation of farmers i think is really it's important to me um, and I think it should be important to everyone. So they grow really beautiful mix of everything seasonal. So right now we're getting eggplants and peppers and that's on its way out. And then pretty soon we'll be getting carrots and kales. And um, we always get lots of beautiful turnips from them and herbs. Um, and, and that's, you know, whatever they're growing is what we're going to take for sure. Um, and then uh, I really love, Newcastle Green. So Ellie is farming up there and she also likewise, we're in that kind of transition from summer to autumn now where it's going from all the peppers and chilies, the last of the tomatoes, some corn into what will be months of cauliflowers and kales and pumpkins. And, um, but they're all really delicious. I, I certainly am the type of chef that likes to buy lots of kind of more lines of vegetables as opposed to little herbs and flowers. Um, I wish I, I wish I thought more along those lines, but I'm much more like, just give me a bowl of roasted carrots. Um, and I think that's, that's what we do at Fred. So that's mainly what we buy. You, uh, you've become renowned for the way that you cook lamb and it's often uh, on, on the menu, but you also hero um, species like John Dory and, King George Whiting. Um, what's, what's it been like 
uh, using Australian sort of seafood and, and meat compared to your days in California? Oh, it's been such an education, especially in the realm of seafood. Um, in, in California, you know, there's a lot of incredible things that you find there, but the variety of things that I find here is just, you know, knocks it out of the, f- <laughs> makes California look like they have three fish and that's it. So, um, it's, it's pretty amazing what he, us in Sydney has access to. Um, and I've had to learn a lot, you know, I think the, um, I've had to learn which fish likes what treatment, which I think is, it took me a while, but, um, you know, as you know, Huck, um, they all have, um, different ways they like to be cooked and, um, and it took a while to figure that out for me, but, but I'm up for the challenge. I'm still learning. I I really am not the seafood expert, but I do love just cooking and using intuition and trying new things and trying to reach, reach the peak of like, what is making this the best it's going to be and making sure that you can still taste it um, and celebrating its best characteristics. The last year has been challenging for so many people on the planet. Uh, What's it been like for you running a restaurant in, in Sydney that compared to a lot of the globe has not been that heavily impacted, um, but has been impacted and you've got family and friends back in America. What's it been like for you the last year? Um, well, at first, you know, I think like everyone was totally devastated and just scared, you know, didn't, I remember thinking back to around this time last year and thinking I was so, we were so scared of like the virus, you know, like you just didn't staying at home felt really good, felt really safe, but you know, you still had to go out and go to work and I still had to like put on a brave face and the staff was asking all these questions that you couldn't answer and didn't know what was going to happen. And then ultimately the decision was made for us. And then I think, you know, a really nice, like peaceful time just at home, cooking in my home kitchen, reflecting on things. That was actually such a welcome gift that I never would have had. Um, So we here in Australia, we all know are incredibly fortunate um, compared to a lot of people. I was always really scared for my parents, um, but they've both been vaccinated now, which I'm so happy about. Um, and then, you know, once we reopened, it felt really optimistic. You know, we were taking it slow at the beginning. and um, But it seemed like the, the customers, the guests were just dying to get back into the restaurants. Like, you know, I had people calling me all the time, like, can I get a table? And, you know, back then it was much smaller capacity. Um, so that was really exciting. And and I think we've just rolled with the punches of, you know, the the scares that we've had over the last year. But knowing that, okay, we know what to do now, or we know what could happen. Um, and, and obviously in Sydney, as compared to Melbourne, we've certainly had it. Um, better in restaurants um, as we've been able to stay open since June or whenever it was we reopened. And it feels, it feels really good to just do the work that we love and to be able to come to a space that we feel is safe um, and that the people are enjoying it. So it's been, man, full circle, all the emotions this year. (laughs) You uh, mentioned your book, Always Add Lemon. Tell us a little bit about that. Is that the sort of dishes you could expect at Fred's or is it more um, home friendly? Tell us a bit about the process of putting that together. Well, it's probably a bit a mixture of both. I think some, so it's, it's dishes that I love to cook at home. It, it's a lot of food that, you know, I probably would have entertained with as opposed to, um, you know, just making for one or two people. So, but this was written pre the time of um, a lot of people spending <laughs> quiet nights in at home. Um, so I'd say that's probably the only thing in retrospect that, um, didn't quite fit in with this year, but it's food that I love. It's how I cook. Um, and yes, it is geared more towards the home cook than the restaurant cook, but, um, you know, it's a lot of fresh flavors, mostly fruits and vegetables, a little bit of meat and fish. Um, and then some projects, which are like fresh cheese, bread making, etc. cetera. Um, all the things that I find highly um, fun when I'm at my home kitchen. 
you've been here um, for seven years now, um, and the last year's been challenging, but you've really made your mark on the culinary landscape and released a book. What, what, what have you got on the agenda for the next couple of years? Well, you know, I feel like I've been asking myself that, uh, you know, for many years, just I'm, I've always been the like, what's next? What am I going to do after that? Blah, blah, blah. And I feel like for the first time um, since I started on this journey of being a chef, I really just feel happy with where I'm at. And I'm not thinking too far into the future. I love the work that I do at Fred's. I love the team that I work with. And, you know, five years in, I'm still excited to go into work every day. So that's a pretty good thing. And and the book was such an excellent exercise in terms of consolidating a lot of my ideas and reflecting on who I am as a chef and, and what are the things that I think are important to tell people when they're cooking at home. And I'd love to do that again, because I thought that was a really fun process. Um, and, and also really, it's funny how like, even when you're writing something that isn't, it's not like, um, conceptual or anything, but it does conjure up all of those creative feelings that um, maybe are lacking sometimes in a day to day in a restaurant where you're just, you're operating, you're running, it's, you know, revenue, it's wage costs, it's all that stuff. So you have to really make time and effort. And when you're writing a book, you have to make that time and effort. And so it, it really helped a lot of areas of my of my life, of my creativity, et cetera. And I just want to stay healthy and keep doing what I'm doing. Well, being in a happy space like that is, is a beautiful thing to hear. We've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today. Thank um, you. I know we're going to see so much more of you and it's been amazing seeing um, what you've done um, to the Sydney dining landscape since you've been here. So um, please keep in touch and uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Huck. I appreciate you having me on. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.